glad this is not all there is. Although this ain't bad. Well, it's good to see you this morning. Um, I'm still out of breath. I think I'm going to take a drink of water. Y'all just chill for a second. Y'all catch your breath yet? Did I give you enough time? It's amazing to me sometimes the unique opportunities that God gives you. And this morning's one of those unique opportunities that uh, God would provide uh, for me to open his word. Um, it's, it's hard to believe it's been almost a year since um, God brought our family here. Um, and he continues to amaze me at how he works. Um, this church is blessed to be served by, um, right now, 43 active uh, deacons. And this is the time of the year when we as a church, uh, those deacons uh, serve, that not all of them came last year, but those deacons serve in three-year terms. And then they rotate off for a year uh, to give them a time of rest. Um, and then they're eligible to, to come back again. And it also gives us an opportunity as a church to, um, to recognize what God's doing in the lives of, of some others to, um, to get them into the opportunity of serving. And so over these next um, three or four weeks and through the 1st of September, you'll have the opportunity um, to nominate men to serve as deacons and um, Pastor Joey gave me the opportunity being that he's in South Africa to uh, deliver the annual deacon sermon now my dad's a deacon and I'm a pastor and so I don't uh, you know pastors if you get pastors alone they tend to tell deacon jokes sometimes if you get deacons alone they tell pastor jokes and so I'm not going to tell any deacon or pastor jokes this morning in fact, my, my kids tell me, and all of my kids are, are in town this weekend, which uh, doesn't happen very often, but my kids tell me, Dad, when you try to be funny, you're not. <laughs> so you're in good shape. I'm not going to tell any jokes this morning, not intentionally. Um, I, I've, I've, uh, I've preached on, on deacons and deacon passages um, a few times as a pastor and normally uh, a deacon sermon uh, the most typical deacon passage to go from is for, and found in first Timothy chapter 3 but this morning uh, as I prayed about it over the last few weeks um, I, I really felt like God would have us go to Acts chapter 6 where we find the first mention of those words uh, for deacon and we see what happened in the early church. And so uh, if it's all right with you, uh, we'll veer from the normal. And uh, I'm a, I was a church planter, so I'm not used to normal anyway. Um, but So we'll veer from what you might think is normal. And let's go to Acts chapter 6. And we'll read together, beginning at, at verse 1. Um, here's what's going on. We don't know exactly how long it's been, but based on context, we can figure it's been about two, three, maybe four years since Pentecost. Since uh, Jesus ascended, Spirit of God comes, Holy Spirit comes down and, and, uh, and dwells believers, and uh, so the church has been growing. The number of believers has been growing, and growing rapidly. And although there's incredible persecution from the outside, Satan has not been able to stop the growth of God's church. It's amazing what happens when God starts something that it's pretty difficult to stop it because he's God. And so Satan has not been successful at stopping the church. In fact, the more he persecutes the church, the more it grows. I could take you to a whole bunch of missionary quotes that talk about that. The blood of martyrs is the spark of the growth of the church. It, it just tends to do that. For some of us, we wonder about praying for persecution in America. 
In fact, for many of our brothers and sisters around the world, what they're praying for America is persecution for the church so that we would see the gospel spread. Not so life would be harder for us, but they just know from personal experience. But Satan hadn't been very successful so from the outside, so what's he do? He goes inside. And he doesn't go inside and try to totally destroy everything. What he does is he uses one of his great tactics, distraction. If I can't destroy something and if I can distract it, it does almost the same thing. And so we pick up verse 1, Acts chapter 6. Let's read together. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, so they were growing, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews. These are the non uh, Arabic speaking Jews. They're not, um, they're not necessarily abiding by Jewish tradition. And they may not be Jews by birth. So there's a, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. There's a problem going on. And that is the average lifespan is believed to have been somewhere between 30 and 40 years old for a man at the time. And at that time, you didn't leave your inheritance to your wife. By law, the inheritance was left to your children. And so your wife was dependent on others. Well, if you're a wife in your 20s or 30s whose husband's died and you're dependent on your children who might be young, that's pretty difficult. So we've got a problem. So the twelve summoned, these are the twelve uh, disciples slash apostles, if you want to call them that, summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Now, we'll get to what that actually says in a minute, because at the moment you might want to say, well, who are they to say they don't want to serve people. That's not what they're saying. I'll get back to that in just a minute. Verse 3, therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we may put in charge of the task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip. Now, these are the last two that you'll ever hear from again in the text. Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. Does that mean they weren't important? No, but we just don't hear from them again. Listen to what it says about Nicholas. He was a proselyte from Antioch. So he was a, a native Jew. Interesting. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid hands on them. In that custom, the laying on of hands was an affirmation of God's calling on your life to a task, to a role. The word of God kept spreading. And the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And many of the priests, and, and some believe that it could be up to 8,000 priests, lay priests, people who had influence in the community who would go into the temple and serve on a rotating basis, that many of those 8,000 priests were becoming obedient to faith. Well, you know, when I started doing, um, breaking this text down, I came up with three P's and something else and I decided I just really did not want to have a sermon full of the same letter. So I, I, I changed it. I had someone help me so I wouldn't be alliterating and mess. It just annoys me and then I did it to myself. So number one, I, I want you to see what the issue was. Chapter 6 verse 1. There were distinct and real physical needs going on. The issue, there, there were physical needs. They were real. They, they weren't drummed up. They weren't government driven. They were real physical needs. And the disciples were trying to help fill these needs. In fact, it wasn't just them. If you look on back in the book of Acts, the church 
uh, the, the body of believers, what they were doing was is they were bringing all their stuff to try to help their brothers and sisters. It was what the church was. It's what the church is supposed to be. When we see people in need, we're supposed to help. So there was a legitimate physical need. And there's also another problem. Like it or not, there was prejudice in the church. Prejudice in the church because some people weren't natural born Jews. And, but I distinctly remember Jesus going to places like Samaria. Don't you? See, we're, we're not under a religion. We're under relationship with our Savior. But they're having problems with it. They're struggling with it. Generations of prejudice against people who weren't Jews. And, and maybe it's because they'd been oppressed for so long. They just had this wall up. But they're struggling. Take care of your own first. Legitimate physical, relational issues that need to be dealt with. So what did they come up with? Here's the process. I love what they said in verse 2. So the twelve summoned the congregation of disciples and said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. They didn't say that it was above them to serve the people. What they said was is that their main calling as the pastors of the church was to be to the word of God and to prayer. And the way the Greek structure there is, is that it, God wouldn't be pleased if they neglected this to do this. It wasn't that they shouldn't do this. It wasn't that they shouldn't serve. It wasn't that they shouldn't minister to the people, but they shouldn't neglect this at the cost of this. And so what did they do? They, they, they told the people, and I love what it says there. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, who we may put in charge of the task. And we're going to devote ourselves to these other things. It doesn't mean they're not going to serve. It doesn't mean they're not going to visit the sick. It just says this is what we're going to devote our primary purpose to. And the statement found approval with the whole congregation. I love what they did. When there's a problem, when there's an issue, legitimate issue, the first thing they did is they go back and they revisit their purpose and their mission. Did you get that, Roy? I love that. When, when there's, he's sitting there back here nodding his head at me. I, I like that. It helps me out. They, they go back and they revisit why they're there. Because what it does is it puts in context the issue. It puts in context the potential solutions. Because we can't neglect the main purpose why we're here. And if you go back to Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, the great commission that Jesus himself left, go into all the world and make disciples. That's the main mission. It didn't mean the, these weren't legitimate issues. It doesn't mean they shouldn't address them. But it sometimes helps. It doesn't just sometimes. It often helps go back and revisit why we're here. Pastor Jamie got up and did the welcome this morning. And he does what we, we've talked about doing. And that's remind us why we're here. To help all people experience an authentic, meaningful relationship with God and each other. That's why we're here. We want people to know God. How do you know God? Through Jesus Christ. It's the gospel. Revisit the mission and their purpose. God wouldn't be pleased if we neglect the mission and the purpose to do this, though it may be good. And see, that's what one of Satan's main tools is in the church. 
He can get you to focus on something that's good to the point of neglecting what's best. And that's why they went through the process. Satan need only get us distracted from the mission and purpose to render us ineffective even when the activity is necessary and good. I love what they did next though. They're about to release the people but they set qualifications and boundaries. Qualities and boundaries. Here's what they said. Look for men of good reputation. If you look at the language what it says good character. Good character. I was reading some uh, uh, in George Barna's research this week and I came ac across this quote that people outside the church are saying about the church, about people in the church, about leaders in the church. Here's what people outside the church are saying about leaders in the church. Character is not like competencies for which it's acceptable to ignore your weakness and run to your strength. Weakness of character will eventually undermine any strength you have, no matter how strong it is. Did you catch the meaning of that? People outside the church are saying, of the people in the church, I don't care how good you are at what you do, bad character will undermine that every time. And we see that all across our nation. Look for men of good character. Why is it that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it lays out those qualifications of a deacon in maybe a little more detail? What are the two things, what are the two things that break up marriages and ruin lives of married adults more than anything else? Money and sex. Money and sex. Check out the people that they're dealing with and what they're dealing with. They're dealing with the distribution of funds to needy people and with material possessions and material goods to needy people. And who are those needy people? Many of them are widows. If you need people of good character doing stuff, that's something you need men of good character doing. Number two quality was walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. What's it look like when you're walking in the Spirit? If you have your Bible and you want to turn, it's not going to be on the screen this morning. I, I, I threw this in. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. What's it look like when someone's walking in the Spirit? But the fruit of the Spirit is... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. What's it look like when someone's walking in the Spirit? That's what it looks like. And then it says someone who's full of wisdom. We live in a culture that says, get all you can get while you can get it. David Platt, a pastor over in um, Alabama, wrote a book called Radical. And he talks about the fallacy of what we call the American dream. The American dream, if you ask people outside the church, and unfortunately when you ask them, people inside the church many times, it's about acquiring a certain status. It's having a certain home. It's having a certain car. It's having certain financial stabilities or at least the appearance of financial stabilities. But what we've developed in America is this deal of credit by which the American dream pushes you to get it as quick as you can before you're ready before you've saved up enough to sustain it. And so what I would say to you is, is that 
wisdom would display itself in ways like someone who's not financially strapped all the time because they're going to be dealing with people who have need and trying to help them. You want people who make good financial decisions to help people who are struggling, right? If someone has kids who never behave, who are always in trouble, do you want them giving counsel to somebody who doesn't potentially have two parents in the home on how to raise kids? No. Someone who has some maturity and wisdom. The interesting thing about our American culture is, is that that doesn't necessarily drive itself by age. You with me? Just because someone's older doesn't mean they act in wisdom. It's a very common thing for me to deal with people who are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who are still living by the skin of their teeth. It, it, it amazes me sometimes when I'm dealing with people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who are still enabling their 30 and 40 year old children to not have to take responsibility. Y'all okay? This, this is not easy stuff. This is hard stuff. I'm not yelling at you, but it's hard. See, that's wisdom. Do they make good choices? Will they help someone else make good choices? It's important. So, they have good character. They walk in the Spirit, which means they often walk by faith. You see them making faith decisions, but there's wisdom along with it. Those are qualities. And then what they do, they released the people to go find the seven men. Well, the selection. Here's what happens. Verse 5, it says that they found that, uh, a positive response from the people. And then they chose, and they list the seven men that they chose. Look at the people they chose. They have names that are not Jewish. They didn't go to the good old boy network to find the people. They used wisdom when they went. They didn't just choose people from Jerusalem. They chose people who could minister to the people they were serving. They used wisdom. And then they brought them to the apostles, to the, the pastors of the church for their approval. Sometimes, because of what we do, we know things you don't. Sometimes somebody has the appearance that they've got it all together, but because of what we do, we know there's major struggles in their family, and you're like, well, they look like they got it all together. You know what I'm talking about. But inside, they didn't have it all together. At home, they might not have it all together. They look good on the outside when they walk in and say, how are you? And you say fine, and they say fine. It's all fine till you really get down to it. And so that's the role pastors can play. Because sometimes we know. And then they confirm for ministry with public affirmation. That's what we do in ordination. When we see that someone has been called to do it, they have the qualities to do it, they've been through the process and we know they're ready to do it, then we bring them before the church, which we do at ordination last October. Man, I don't know if you were, any of you were here, but what a beautiful, beautiful time it was when we laid hands on uh, our new deacons who hadn't been ordained before. It was a great time, spiritual time. Affirming their calling. Here, here's the interesting thing. What was the result? You know you made good choices when the results come. Now, the bad part is in, in the spiritual, in the church, 
Um, sometimes the results don't come till later. And so we don't know exactly how long all this took. So don't think it happened the next day. But, but here's the results. Verse 5 says that there was unity in the body. It's always a great thing when you have an issue in the church and you go through a positive process to come up with a solution and you walk away together saying, I may, not, I may not like one of those seven guys, but I really agree with the process we went through. It was a good process. We all feel like we're together and there's going to be a solution to the problem. Unity in the body. Read verse 7. Here's what it says. The word of God kept spreading. And the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And even a large number of the priests became obedient in faith. Unexpected. Who would have ever thunk it? Really, who would have thought the priest would have come to faith in Christ? But they did. Notice what it doesn't say about the results. It says nothing about the Hellenistic women were happy with the service they were now getting. Does it say that? No. Can we make assumption that, that it helped the problem? Yes. But what was the result they were looking for? Back to the purpose and the mission. See, sometimes what happens in the church is we focus on the issue and did it all get fixed rather than did it get fixed so that we can focus on the mission. It doesn't mean the issue wasn't real. It doesn't mean that there weren't real problems going on. It didn't mean they shouldn't deal with them. But when it all came out, the result was is the word of God was spread and people were coming to faith in Christ. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. Well, that was two of the results. I want to tell you a couple little stories from on down in the book of Acts about results of deacons who have character, who are walking in the Spirit, and who have wisdom. Let's hear what happened to two of the guys. I'm just going to tell you the stories because it would take too long to read. What happens? Stephen... He's taking care of his duties. But what do we hear about Stephen? He's out preaching the word. He's spreading the word. He's spreading the gospel. And he's spreading the gospel to the point where it's offending the religious people. And it didn't just offend him a little bit. It offends them a whole lot. It offends them so much that they bring him into a circle and they pick up stones and they stone him to death. One of the results of the process is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Look, folks, when we're following Jesus, there will be required sacrifice. And Stephen was willing to give it all for the sake of the gospel. And I would encourage you that as you're looking for men to nominate to serve as deacon, I look for men who are willing to sacrifice for the cause of the gospel. That would have been a great place for an amen. <laughs> Last result. We find in Chapter 8, verses 4 through 40. As a result of the persecution and the stoning of Stephen, the church was scattered. They got comfortable, but persecution came. And they were scattered. So you got this other guy named Philip, who's a deacon. Did he stop serving people? No. But he's faithfully sharing the gospel. Faithfully sharing the gospel. He's in the word. He's listening to God because what happens to Philip is God calls him and says, you're in the middle of a great revival, but I want you to go down to Gaza. 
because I got a mission for you. He was a man who, because of his relationship with God, heard God speak. And the gospel went to another continent. Not as a result of one of the apostles, but one of the deacons. That's good stuff right there. Hey, they, didn't, they, they commissioned Paul later and Barnabas, but it went to Africa because of Philip's obedience to God. And because he'd been dealing with it, there was no prejudice when he walked up to the Ethiopian. He just listened to God and he went. I got emails from Pastor Joey this week, and he sent me quick notes. He doesn't have much internet access, and he said, he, he said I've, he'd never been to Africa before. My brother's a missionary in Uganda, East Africa, and I've been there. And, and um, so, I, you know, I try not to tell too many people what it's like till they go so they have a, an idea. Different place. Deacons ought to be people who listen to God and are willing to be obedient to wherever God wants to send them. It's the kind of men they ought to be. And God uses that. God uses that obedience. The Spirit filled. Walking in the Spirit. Listening to God. Good character. Walking in wisdom to spread the gospel. Which means there's more worshipers of Jesus Christ. Which is God's mission for us. Spread the gospel so there are more worshipers of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. That's why after we come to know Christ, he doesn't just take us zip up to heaven. That's why we've got to wait for the midnight cry. Because he wants more worshipers of his son Jesus who then reflects that to him. That's what he wants. Interestingly enough, in our second service at this spot, we're actually going to have a baptism. A young person who gave their life to Christ as a result of people investing in them. It's a great thing. When you see people that you invest your life in come to faith in Christ. But here's what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to kneeling at the throne and seeing people around me that I invested my life in that I had no clue. Maybe I invested in them and you invested in them and you invested in them and someone up there invested in them and they're there because of the investment. You may not be the one who gets to kneel with them as they pray to receive Christ. You may not be the one who gets to be in the baptistry with them. But I tell you what, Philip may have been the one to lead the Ethiopian to Jesus Christ and to baptize him, but it was on the shoulders of Stephen who was the one who was bold enough to proclaim the gospel when it was tough and to take the stones. It was on the shoulders of him. It was on the shoulders of Stephen that Paul, who stood and held the coats of those who stoned him, it was, in, it was on the shoulders of Stephen that Paul became a follower of Christ. You never know who's watching. You never know who's watching. I just want to give you a couple points of application here, and, and I'm done. People do not develop character because they get a position. Just because you make someone a deacon doesn't mean they'll get character. People don't walk more in the spirit because they get a position. People don't share the gospel more just because they get a position. I want to encourage you to look for men who exhibit great character, who walk in the Spirit, who exhibit faith, and who serve those who need help already and are already those who are quick to share the gospel. They won't start doing it because you nominate them as a deacon. 
You all okay? All right. You should nominate someone whose gospel testimony you have heard and witnessed by their life. If you haven't heard someone's gospel witness, you don't know them well enough to nominate them as a deacon. That's truth. You should nominate someone whose life has displayed character and whose family reflects, whose family life reflects that consistently. You should nominate someone whose call to serving others is noticeable and who displays a willingness to sacrifice personally for the sake of the gospel and others. And number four, you should nominate someone who understands and is engaged in the primary mission of a believer in the church, which is making disciples. Those are the kind of people you should nominate. Those are the kind of people you should select because you notice it already in them. And then at the point where you lay your hands on them, you're affirming the call and you're commissioning them into the work. So for the rest of us who are, are not or are not called to be deacons, here's what I want to challenge you with this morning. All of us, though we may not be called to the role of deacon, we should aspire to the qualities of one. You with me? We should all aspire to it. We should all want to be like that. People of good character who walk in faith, who, who serve others, who, who make wise choices, who are quick to share the gospel and be obedient when God calls. And so I just want to ask you this this morning. Is there an area of your life, one of those qualities maybe, where God just put his finger on your heart he did it with me this week. Is there an area of your life and your walk with Christ where God put his finger on it this morning and said, you need to make progress here. You need to make progress here. Maybe you need to repent of sin. Maybe you need to repent of apathy. Repentance isn't bad. It's a beautiful thing. Repentance is so awesome that God allows us even when we mess up to have a process of becoming right with him again and being usable again. Repentance isn't bad. The altar is not a bad place. The altar is a place of reconciliation and burden lifting. That's what it is. Hearing God speak and responding in obedience is the key to growing in your Christian faith. Trying harder is not the answer. That's my problem. I just want to try harder. Trying harder is not the answer. Faith and obedience is the answer. If you're not yet a follower of Christ this morning, maybe I've told you this before. This was a pretty specific message this morning. Last time I preached on tithing, I sat down and God convicted me that I didn't give someone the opportunity to receive Christ. If God's working in your life, it doesn't matter what I was preaching on this morning. God's working in your life and drawing you to himself. And I just want to let you know, this is a great time. In fact, this is the best time that you could give your life to Jesus Christ. It's hard, but it's simple. It's hard because it takes you giving up your will for the will of God in your life. It's simple because he just asks you to admit to him that you're a sinner. Confess that. Believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, rose again from the dead, and that he will forgive you of your sin, come into your life, if you just ask him. And do that. And trust him. He's trustable. He's trustable. He never lets you down. We're going to close this morning by singing a song called, Lord, I Need You. And I think no matter where you are in your life, if you walk away with that this morning, God, I need you. It may be very, very specific for you this morning. It may be not that specific for you. You just get a sense that I need God to do something in my life. Tell him. And then when he shows you, respond to what he says. He's an awesome God. And he's worthy of our lives. He's worthy of all that we are and all that we have. Won't you pray with me?